Trades Union Congress debate Britain's future. Yes, there are seven millions of us in Britain's trade unions. On every job there's a trade union to represent the workers, to speak on their behalf in the workshop, as well as round the national conference table. That's our father of the chapel, standing over there, talking to the works manager. We printing workers elect him to go between us and the management, to settle any differences that may arise during the night's work to see that the provisions of the joint agreement signed by the management and our trade union are carried out. It's the same in every branch of industry. Wherever there's production, the men and women on the job find they need an organization to look after their interests. Find they need a trade union. Take a big place like this. Against the scale and size of these works, the individual seems small, helpless and unimportant. The men and women employed here need someone to speak for them as a body, need someone to handle their day-to-day -day problems. How else can the varied problems of wages and working conditions that arise almost every day be dealt with? So the men and women on the job choose a shop steward, whose duty it is to be the voice of his fellow workers. Working on the job himself, he is elected by the workers in one small section of industry and is recognized by the management as the work people's delegate to speak for them in all that affects the men and women employed in that section. Perhaps a pay calculation is wrong. It is the shop steward's job to get it put right. In a place like this, the shop steward usually takes the matter to the departmental foreman, and through the departmental foreman, it will usually be put right at once. Things like this crop up frequently. Their prompt settlement ensures the smooth working of industry. In this way, Mistakes or grievances in shop or department can speedily be righted by brief discussion between management and workers' representative. At the branch meeting of the trade union concerned, the shop steward will report all his actions to the local members. They will decide the rights and wrongs of matters he brings forward. In the give and take of free discussion, workshop problems are hammered out. Wrongs and injustices ventilated will be remedied. The majority vote decides, and so the actions of the shop steward are controlled by the trade union members themselves. But some of the issues that arise between work people and managements may affect many more than just those on the one job. Such matters have to be discussed by the entire union and perhaps negotiated nationally with the employers. So, through the trade union branch, it will be referred to the area or district committee of the union. And from there, if need be, to the national executive of the union which is governed by rules and decisions made by conferences of delegates representing all the members. In this case, the union represents workers on all kinds of jobs and in all kinds of industries. Their general secretary, Mr. Charles Dukes, may have to take the problem beyond the councils of his own union to the general council of the Trades Union Congress, where matters of concern to all organized workers in all industries are discussed. The Trades Union Congress represents every form of trade unionism in Great Britain, and there are many different kinds of unions. Mr. M. Hodgson, for example, is on the general council representing boilermakers, a group of highly skilled craftsmen. Mr. W. P. Allen sits on the council to speak for the men who drive the trains on Britain's railways. Other unions may be unions representing federations of old established craft unions. Mr. Wollstonecroft represents a union of building trades which gathers together the separately organized groups of bricklayers, tilers, painters, carpenters, laborers. Or they may be unions organizing all the workers in one particular industry like the National Union of Railwaymen, whose representative, Mr. Banstead, speaks for the porters, the plate layers, the carriage cleaners, the signalmen, the ticket collectors, who combine to serve Britain's railways. Road transport workers and dockers are all combined in the Transport and General Workers' Union. Dayman Laughlin speaks for all the skilled cutters and machine workers in the garment trades. Mr. William Holmes 
represents the National Union of Agricultural Workers, which organizes all the workers on Britain's farms, all those who work on the land and grow the food to feed our people. Mr. George Isaacs speaks for all the workers in the printing trades, mainly those of us on the great newspapers, on the linotype machines, on the great presses, except the compositors who have their own union for their own craft. The form of union organization varies, but all unions do much the same job. Besides securing established rates of wages and settled working conditions, most of them strive to take care of those of their members who, through sickness, loss of work, or accident, are deprived of their weekly income. Nearly all the unions have funds paid in by all the members to help those in need, to provide help in time of trouble, and to give legal advice and representation over compensation rights in the courts of law. More and more in recent years, the unions have voiced the opinion of their members about the way the work is done about how to improve and increase production, and about how industry can be so managed to serve the interests of everybody. In the coal fields of Britain, production committees discuss how to get more coal from the pits. A trade union leader was Britain's Minister of Labour in the War Cabinet, and directed the great manpower resources of this country. More and more, because of trade union organisation, Men and women working in the mills and the mines, the fields and the factories, the shops and the offices, no longer feel themselves helpless cogs in a great machine, but men and women with rights, with something to contribute to the working and running of industry, with a philosophy of life that comes from collective effort on the basis of common interest. Working in field and factory teaches men and women how much we depend on one another that by ourselves we're helpless, together we can help make the world a much better place to live in. That is really what trade unionism is. An organized expression of the simple idea that together all people can better themselves. Each for all and all for each is an old trade union slogan. And that is trade unionism's contribution to world problems of today and tomorrow, teaching that we must all share alike the dangers and the hardships, teaching that we must meet our common difficulties together so that we can all share in the good things that make life worth living. We British trade unionists look ahead, beyond day-to-day -day matters, to great and wide social changes. Our aim is not only to improve conditions for our own members, but to build a nobler, better world for all men. So that all who work for the common wheel, who build the boats to bridge the world, who weave the cloth to clothe the world, who build the homes to house the world, who harvest the fruits of land and sea to feed the world, shall have voice in the world's government and shall share in the good things their labor produces.